This week on Forward, Andrew Yang gets fired and is replaced by Zach Grauman. I've also got Jules Turpak here joining me, and we talk about the future of work, how Gen Z is looking at college, education, and career opportunities after college. We also talk about how Will Smith smacked Chris Rock, because of course we're going to talk about that this week on Forward. Welcome back to Long Shot with your host, Zach Grauman. Andrew Yang has been fired, and now I'm here. I feel like I owe him that because he opened last Thursday's episode with the fact that I was fired with no context, just kind of moved on. I'm here with, Ju- I'm here with Jules Turpak. Is it Turpak or Turpak? Turpak. Damn it. All right. <laughs> no, it's okay. We can keep it I'm like that. I'm here with Jules Turpak, <laughs> the, uh, who's been co-hosting with us um, because we're trying to expand what we're offering, expand our perspectives. Yeah, people in the comments were confused. They were like, did Zach actually Zach get, get fired? fired? Someone like had like a heartfelt comment. But I was like, it's, thank it's you joke. for, by the way, it was like three people. It wasn't a lot. And I'm really <laughs> grateful for the three people that were at least concerned, not necessarily missing me, but concerned that I was fired uh, without without notice. No, I'm still here. Deal with it. Um, <laughs> No, guys, good to be back. What are we doing today? We're we're going to talk about a couple of things, but the biggest one, uh, the biggest kind of overarching topic on this is really the future of work from the young person perspective, particularly boys, I think. But there is a YouTube generation. There is a Gen Z passion economy, gig economy, kind of zeitgeist that is hitting young people. And I'll say this from a personal perspective. When I was in high school, I was trying to figure out yeah, it was always college, 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 but it still yeah. was like, is this, there's still that back of your mind is like, oh, it is $250,000 a year for some of these schools. Is that worth it? And now I think the the veil, the curtain's been ripped away, right? And uh, younger people are questioning that every day. So my first, Jules, let, let's dive in. Uh, I'd love to, I'd love to get your perspective on, let's start this just when you were in high school or even middle school, like what what's the vibe around college? Um for your friends, peers, generation, that kind of thing? Well, I mean, we're not like too far in age, so I think it was the same thing. It's like college is the obvious yes, but um, I mean, with all the bad that COVID brought, it also exacerbated a lot in terms of the education system and also future of work. I remember more so like fast forwarding. So like uh, my first internships and everything, just like how outdated the the time constraints, the Mm. commute and everything felt just from having to sit in this office, whether I get my work done um, two hours earlier in the day or whether I work better maybe at night. Mm. I was like, these time constraints are very, very outdated. And also just with the the education system too, like um, what is it? I think it's over 70% of college students change their major at least once, <laughs> like at that least once, right. which is, which is crazy. You know, that's like a, it used to be like your lifelong career choice. Right. And then it kind of just leads into why I think it's like, um, 13% of, uh, U S adults are passionate about their careers. It just funnels right into that yep. as well. So just knowing that, yeah, I changed my major, I believe twice. And I was like, and by the end of college, um, I felt like I don't even like my major, but no, I'm not going to change it a third time Marty, because, sunk yeah, cost. yeah, sunk cost, 100 <laughs> percent. So it was crazy with the pandemic because it exacerbated, first of all, work from home, which, to be honest, it probably would have been another five years until that became yeah, like, normalized. We accelerated a few things. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember uh, my corporate job they weren't even touching work from home. I think the e-commerce department at one point had one day work from home. They ended up taking it back because they were just like, (laughs) the CEO didn't like it. And then, yeah, and of course it exacerbated people feeling comfortable taking gap years, um, which is really, really important, so. So there's this narrative that um, our generation's been able to kind of buck. So like my parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, it was a, you know, come back from World War II, we win World War II and it's like, okay, now build the, we've seen evil, build the country, right? Yeah. And it was less about the individual, more about the collective good, the collective whole. And it yeah. was, um, if you got problems, bottle them up, mm-hmm. <laughs> don't talk about them, bury them deep. Um, 
And no one cared really, at least the sense I got, obviously wasn't there, but that, you know, if you didn't like your job or feel fulfilled in your job, you're happy to have a job and yes. be contributing, right? And be productive, quote, productive member of society. And that has changed for a number of reasons. One, I think it's wealth and prosperity and peacetime, right? Like we really haven't had any wars in the United States where we needed to like really even raise taxes for said war. Like the cost on the American citizens for us going to war has been essentially zero. Yep. Um, and then you then have social media and the rise of the attention economy where it's um, more about more about me, more about uh, my passion, my love, my <laughs> my personal brand and identity. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is I didn't I grew up when that was changing, right? Mm -hmm. I grew up like AIM AOL Instant Messenger was a thing <laughs> in middle back. school and then texting started mm -hmm. um and then smartphones became a thing when I was like midway through college and then that kept going. But there's kids where they all they've known is the smartphone, right? And just rapid technology and that sort of thing. So, have you you know, do you think there's a pressure on you or your peers to find your passion instead of instead of find something you're good at or find something that's quote productive yeah well i think carly actually made a tweet the other day that i thought was really interesting it's like a it's I, i'm not gonna word it right but it was like she said uh instead of follow your passion like follow your curiosity is mm -hmm. the best way to go kind yeah. of what you're talking to like yeah find things that make you curious but you can actually be re really good at because this passion economy is interesting because you know we see a lot of content creators and everything um blowing up more so from the creative realm, making videos and everything. Um, but the passion economy also isn't all it's made out to be, like this weird thing mm -hmm. of having to monetize, yeah, all your hobbies or everything yeah. like that. And then do are they really hobbies anymore when you have to put <laughs> all this time into them and you're then entitled to, obviously, when it, you're connecting this to how to make you make money you're yep. all, with all these time constraints and it's not so authentic anymore. And it also takes a lot of the fun out of it, probably a lot of your creativity out of it because mm -hmm when you're pushed to such strict time constraints that takes a lot of creativity. That's just not the nature of actual creative work. Right. But I mean, just thinking about where we're headed with the future of work and kind of again back to college when you're picking this one major and um, even just a generational difference. I think millennials are staying at jobs average like max five years. Adults mm -hmm. before that were high, like yeah. 15 to 20. Our generation, I assume, is going to be like a year per job. Yeah. And there's studies, though, about um, for Gen Alpha specifically. Yes, there is a generation under Gen Z, which is like the kids under 12 years old or Gen, Alpha, Gen Alpha, which is a pretty sick name. That is a sick name. So Gen Alpha or Alpha because Gen? Because it's like it's Gen Alpha, but it's not like so I, Gen and Millennia are like a, a separate from the alphabet mm. distinction. So Gen Alpha is going to definitely stick there. Might have, they have, might have different nicknames. Gen Alpha. Yeah, it's a pretty sick name, but they're predicted like aside from like your jobs in high school and your jobs in college in their actual adulthood careers are predicted to have um, hold 17 different job jobs across five different industries. So that that's pretty crazy compared to 17 what, jobs, five industries, as opposed to my dad, same like, industry. religious guy would always pray yeah. for stability, like the same job, same company, just wants a job and a paycheck and that. And it's just that is so different than what you're talking about. Yeah, and, and across five different industries, that's huge in itself. It's just rapidly changing how we're gonna be going about work. I saw an NYU professor um, at one of our, I used to do these UBS client events. Mm -hmm. We bring in like these compelling speakers and one guy came in and he said, uh, the only skill set that matters is the ability to learn new skills. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're growing up in this, you get that. Um, but is there, I, I, I'm questioning on the, mi the mixed messaging, particularly, uh, I mean, to both boys and girls, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, but this, and Scott Galloway talks about it a lot, who I really like, Prof G. And he said, you know, it's the biggest load of crap to be told, follow your passion, follow your passion. Yeah. Because, um, and people are very successful, like, I followed my passion, just do you. And it's frustrating because if you're a world-class artist and you're like, follow my passion, just do you, just let your own self express out there. You're right. If you're world-class and you're one of the best artists in the world, then yes, follow that passion and be completely unique. But because if you can make a lot of money off of probably correct. that one and thing. And you're a once-a-generational yeah. talent. And there's, um, 
there's other folks with brilliant minds and brilliant skill sets and athletic abilities, things like that, where it's like, follow, sure, follow that, great. But most of us aren't that. Yes. Um, and so following that passion may lead you to, frankly, like trying to be elite at something mm -hmm. you're not elite at. And probably, you know, the the, the adi adage is don't do what, um, don't have a career in something that a billionaire would do for free or that rich yeah. people do for free. And is that like, it's why like, you know, and like nothing against people have done this. So I love like starting breweries or wineries mm -hmm. or things like that are, it's just a very, very competitive space because that's what richer, wealthier people do when they retire is mm -hmm. they create fun stuff like that. Um, which is not, you know, I'm not saying that's a rule or that I stand by that, but it is, there's something about like the sex appeal of careers or the passion. Yeah. And that's, and has, been, has that been drilled into you? Is like, what is that? How does that hit you? in high school nowadays or in college nowadays and what kids are seeing. Yeah, before I forget too, like to your point, yeah, these out, outliers, outliers that, for example, an artist, like a crazy once in a generation artist, yeah, they can take one painting and like make, yeah, 100K off of one painting and be kind of set for the year while other people, yeah, who, who, this is just yeah. their passion and they're not that once right. in a generation. It's like you are gonna be probably having these corporate clients or whatever, you're gonna be stuck to these time constraints. And again, like I was talking about earlier, it's not really gonna feel too passionate anymore. Yes. But anyway, to your point, yeah, I grew up watching a lot of YouTube, like very much um, throughout uh, high school, and now it's more so for kids, YouTube, TikTok, not so much even Instagram anymore. Right. Um, but yeah, you're all over, every day in your face are these people who are just making money off of the internet and kind of their own personalities. Some right. people have more like diff different niches in terms of maybe shock factor content, but a lot of these people are you know, lifestyle creators or whatever it is, and you're just seeing them make a living off of being themselves. So um, that's what you're consuming all day. And when you're obviously whatever content you're consuming is um, contributing to your worldview. So that's in your face, that's what you're kind of Aiming That's towards. what you're getting. And then let me ask you this, because one thing I didn't have was when you were in high school or college, do you have friends just getting super rich off this stuff or becoming, well, it's not, maybe it's not super rich, but it's super famous. So there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers. Maybe you were one of them. I don't know when your TikTok blew up, but no. <laughs> um, like, did you, did you have that with friends? Is it, does that change? I'm assuming that changes the social dynamics. So I feel like I'm at the very oldest of Gen Z. So throughout high school, people, it was still, you just kind of followed your friends on social media. Uh, towards the end, you were kind of following um, people outside of that, like public figures. During college, you're uh, following public figures more. And then you're kind of seeing the rise of content creators mm -hmm. and influencers be looked at as very serious figures. And they are become meshing yep. with public figures. So right now, though, I notice, especially with TikTok for kids, like, yes, in your high school and within your college, there are people who have a huge platform but that's right. so new and like it's becoming normal that yeah a bunch of your peers have these large platforms because tiktok obviously um for people who don't know it's the short form video platform in it the virality on there you could have you could have never had a viral video in your life you could have zero followers that one video just if it has a lot of watch time can be pushed to millions overnight yeah, it's a completely different like it's format. absolutely insane what this thing can do yes You know, in the press, they talk about small businesses and how we have to protect small businesses. And it's annoying because nothing about our business or most people who own a small business, nothing about that feels small. A small business can be millions of dollars in revenue. And when you're running a small business, time is money, which is why I want to talk to you guys about stamps.com because stamps.com saves us money all the time. You don't waste time with either repeated trips to the post office or waiting in line or skipping the nonsense. It lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process so you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy, which is why we love it. For more than 20 years, stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses like ours. So whether you're sending invoices or you got a side hustle Etsy shop or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. You just go online, print out your stamps when you need to mail something, and bang, you can take care of all your shipping needs without having to go to the post office. So we want you to stop overpaying for shipping with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code YANG for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and 
a digital scale with no long-term commitments or contracts. So just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page and enter code YANG. Check it out, guys. I think you'll like it. So what is the the internet, right? Social media. It's um, it's a, it's a version of the mob, right? But yeah. it's a version of this faceless energy going towards um, the mob. Doesn't understand nuance. Things are black and white. There's good and evil, right? Um, there's funny. It's not funny. There's the um, heroes and villains, right? Yep. And you end up in situations where most of life is gray. Most mm-hmm. of life requires nuance. But if you are quote wronged or feel like you are not hurt or upset with a situation or don't like your boss or mad at your mom or you go down whatever it is you can throw it out to the mob at essentially zero cost and then what right and then the person who is you know who has quote wronged you has to now not only ideally make it right to you but also has to listen to the mob or or ignore deal with let's call it deal with the mob um Kids know that nowadays, and is that like does that terrify your teacher? Did you have teachers terrified of like disciplining a child who had hundreds of thousands of TikTok users for fear of God knows what the wrath of the mob or the wrath of you know administration? Well, it's definitely weird now uh, how comfortable people are just recording strangers. You see all the time on <laughs> yeah. TikTok, yeah, whether it's at a concert and you're like zooming in on someone specific doing something maybe a little odd at a concert. These videos just go viral and. Um, I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, kind of like the Karen videos go viral before, yeah, like, sure. you, you know, that that whole stereotypical thing that happened the past few years. But yeah, now it's these uh, videos of strangers are just going viral. And like you're, like you're saying, people can do a video on their teacher and it get millions of views overnight, which is definitely a scary thing because it loses a lot of context. And when you see someone on your For You page, you're so... Um, myself included, everyone on TikTok, you're so used to intaking content from strangers. While on YouTube, you kind of have your typical YouTubers that you tend to flock to or Twitter you right. and Instagram, you have your curated following list. On TikTok, yeah, you're just intaking strangers all day. And you're not really questioning what they're saying at all. No, so just, you're just taking that face value. You have inject no, it. Yeah, you have no nuance into their background or like their motives. Agenda, right. Yeah, it's pretty insane. So Tristan Harris, who is um, highly featured in the document documentary on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, um, that dilemma is complicated. But the bigger one of the biggest things he said is that it's both utopia and dystopia at the same time. Yeah. It's all of the good and all of the bad equally. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's right in that when you're talking about content and you talk about Web3 and you talk about um, the potential of this, it's a, it's like it can't be more amazing. Yeah. Right. You're talking about new types of currencies and people making wealth of it and having access to wealth generating activities they never could have had before. You're talking about valuing creator. You got a list of all the positive stuff. But the negative is really awful, too. Mm -hmm. And it hits boys and girls in different ways, but also simultaneously. I think um, let's start with boys because you shared an article with me from The Wall Street Journal that there's a generation of American men that are giving up on college. Um, And it was 60 percent of college students are women, only 40% of men. Yep. And that number used to be true true the opposite way um, in the 80s or so, definitely well, in the 70s, 60s. This has been a, a trend, like women have taken up uh, slightly more of uh, the percentage of like the college student population mm-hmm. since the 80s. Like, yeah. It's always been true, but it's been exacerbating like crazy um, over the past 10 years, specifically, specifically from 2010. Yeah, rapid rate, it's been going up. So people have talked a lot about the factors of this. What do you mm-hmm. mean from your experience? And let's actually this. It's I don't even necessarily know. I want your opinion, but I also want to know what your I'm assuming your friends see this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was talked about in college. What is like the general reason why? Um, at least why do kids think that I say kids? I don't know. People 10 years younger than me. Well, it's also interesting because it's not just in terms of boys um, deciding not to go to college as a whole. It's even you see it within the application process. So you see within the dropout rate, of course, more men. Um, men, I think, account for 70% of the growth in the dropout rate of college. Yep. But also you see in the application process um, that uh, boys, men at, at 18, I guess you're a man, but yeah. um, 
not attending to their applications as much when it comes to tr not sending mm -hmm. in their transcripts, everything like that. They're like the kind of little details um, boys, men tend to be missing on, which mm -hmm. is very interesting, not as like, I don't know if detail or is the word, but you're seeing a, a lack of motivation in general, just within that process. Even the ones who are yeah putting the effort forth to want to go to college, mm -hmm. you're seeing that, which is very interesting. Do you think, so there's a lot of studies on social media making women mm -hmm and young girls in particular, suicidal, depressed, anxious, mm -hmm. all that. But besides the extreme that we're talking about, where we have major mental health challenges um, to, we're talking about suicide rates, skyrocketing, things like that. But besides the extreme, it doesn't seem to be hurting women's college ad application rates, and let's call it female productivity at a young age. Yep. They're still, let's call it they're anxious, stressed, depressed, but still like, Still crushing it in a classroom. Still thriving. In ways, right? Or they're thriving <laughs> Anxious, online, stressed, right? depressed, but I'm still not, thriving. Yeah. But boys seem not to have the same. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, the anxiety levels are increasing for everybody, but far less than women. But it seems to be sucking some ambition out. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed that? And, and I don't know if you've, um, is that talked about amongst your friends and peers? So I, I really just think this d disconnect with education, I, at the end of the day, we see so. Um, and I believe you and Andrew talked about it about, so women c attempt to commit suicide more than men, but men follow through with it at a Correct. much higher rate. Correct. And I think that just shows that kind of men, I don't know the exact word, but are just kind of more maybe intense mm -hmm. with their decisions. So um, we're even seeing, so I think all of these problems within in, within education, of course, funnel into work. But you're seeing within the great resignation, women were actually leading the way in terms of quitting jobs, mm -hmm. but you're seeing, yeah, the dropout rate and everything that's mostly led by men. Um, so there's definitely like a correlation there. And I really just think there's a complete disconnect right now between yeah, the education system and the future of work um, in terms of, yeah, you're kind of picking one career choice for college and kind of going full in that when in reality, the future of work is much like when you, when you were young and your, your uh, job interest was changing often. Maybe at right. one point I wanted to be a dolphin trainer and at another <laughs> point I wanted to be a lawyer. Like right. um, obviously, we hope our lawyers go to school for a, a long yeah, amount of time, like a few years. But yeah, you're you're just seeing this com complete disconnect between those two. And it's kind of you're seeing it more so within the education system. Boys are reacting to it, reacting to it. But in the workforce, girls are reacting to it just as much. Mm -hmm. My doctor friends, I have three or four. Most of them have FOMO from their uh, friends that didn't go. Because if you're a doctor, you're essentially in right? Like you invest, mm -hmm. you decide when you're a sophomore, essentially in college, and then you're in for another eight years plus a two, you're finishing your undergrad, and yes. then plus like another eight years of residency in co. So you're, you're in. Um, and you, as you like, should as, be as, as, as a doctor, much, I completely yes. agree. And I have no shame. But like, they're, they do struggle with like, my friends are starting companies, my yes. friends are, um, my friends are like, Oh, yeah, my, my friends running for president, I'm a mm -hmm. doctor, like I could have, you know, like, they feel confined in a lane in a yes. way. Um, and I'd say from my perspective as someone who's done, I've had probably three different industries, uh, three or four I've had careers in now or whatever you call it, whatever we call a career at this point, um, <laughs> I've done activities in. Activities. You end up uh, also frustrated too because you're uh, more of a jack of all trades. Mm -hmm. And anytime you're applying for a company or building something, you want someone with a certain level, level of expertise. Yes. Um, and that's not always what you have if you're doing lots of different things, lots of different well, places. Yeah. Well, to that point, I actually um, made a TikTok video that kind of got a lot of reach a few months ago about doctors and how I honestly um, am kind of worried about yeah our, our generation in terms of we already are, are they seeing. They're gonna make it through med school. A hundred percent. No, but like in, in it's a not way, funny. No, but it's, it is. it's not funny. Like, and it's it's a weird thing of like, oh, the people can be like, oh, this is so sad. I I I agree that of course we need doctors and we're already seeing like um, a disconnect in terms of the supply of yeah. people in the field. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I, I've had some like weird health problems. And I remember the one time I was uh, waiting for the doctor to come in and the walls were kind of like, you could you could hear a decent amount. And he oh, was wow. talking to the girl next, uh, well, I don't know if it was a girl, I assumed it was a girl, um, next door about like her cancer diagnosis. And then he just comes over to me like in the next room and you know, it was all cheery. I'm like, how does someone deal with that emotionally on a daily basis? You know, that is your, like your full time job. Not that something like that should be fully automated. Right. Um, but it's 
I don't necessarily like look at it as like a negative. Obviously, we need people in that field for a wide range of reasons. Um, but I can totally understand why there is a disconnect. It's a very mentally and physically taxing job. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I was talking about the worry amongst our generation. Oh, yeah. That's going to be able to go through that. So Andrew, when we were running for president, um, he won the youth poll in Iowa um, and actually most places. Um, for those that, that did poll their youth. Um, yeah. And part of it was because he's super authentic and mm -hmm. there's a lot of distrust in the system and he doesn't feel like he's part of the system. But there was another piece of that um, because he was talking about a lot of things that young people are, are in some ways infuriated or scared by. Um, and automation is a big part of that, which is like this changing career landscape. Yep. Um, and I may ask you like from a personal level, like when you tell how'd you pick where you went to college and what you majored in mm -hmm. um, because now you are like probably by definition a jack of all trades you can do a lot of different things and yeah. have like the upside of doing a lot of different things how did you decide yeah where you wanted to go to school and what you wanted to study yeah so i mean i was a pretty average student school was always typically hard for me because i am more of i need like experiential like learning c's average or no, like, like like uh high b's okay. low a's okay that's um, not average by the way but I appreciate okay. the harsh criticism. Well, amongst my I'm school, I felt like it was <laughs> average. I, I felt like I felt average. I actually average don't know what school. actually. Is. C was always supposed to be average, but yeah, uh, we are the participation trophy generations. Uh, so I don't know. I don't even know if high school still mm -hmm. gives C's. I, I mean, but I always went like bare minimum in terms of studying and everything. Got like it. it was, I just it, it was a disconnect to me and my interest in school. Got so, um, but when I went to college, I initially went in as marketing, but everyone was like, oh, like in terms of like my family was like where did you oh, go to undergrad um duquesne university which yeah. is in pittsburgh it's like oh, it's where i got the most scholarship money but it was a great experience it's yeah. a highly um, suggest <laughs> the, um but when you were deciding yes was it yeah sorry so mm -hmm. what what helped you i mean so money is like the best thing money is like a yes. huge factor is a factor for me too or you know something i that choose to ignore if mm -hmm. i didn't want to um was that the biggest factor or were i mean marketing Oh, what well, I changed my ma major. You did though. change your major. Yeah. But was it a factor on like what I wanted to study or was it more about money? It was 100% about money. Really? I changed to healthcare supply chain. It was li literally just because my friend was like, oh, um, I know someone who majored in supply chain and they made this much out of the gate. And I compared it to the marketing, like average salary out of, like once you're out of so college. So you looked at like the, the literally, that's the only pay of an average graduate. That was the, the only thing that made me change. Because you, you graduated as a healthcare supply, supply chain, chain manager. Which is crazy because wow. everyone was like, what is supply chain? Now everyone talks about supply chain. So oh, well, like, yeah, well, we have issues. issues. So wait, <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you get a job in supply chain, healthcare uh -huh. supply chain? I got a job in supply chain out of college. And okay. um, my major is in college. So my first major was um, within supply chain. It was just like a, a desk job. My second um, uh internship was actually do you know aldi the yeah. love aldi i could talk about that for an hour straight cool. like i am all for aldi fun fact quick about aldi people like rat on it as like a discount grocery store they are just so smart so for example like their chicken is tyson chicken they're all their like cereals are kellogg's for example okay but they have a private label, so they're able to give it to customers cheaper because they have this Aldi private label. Anyway, I could talk about Aldi forever. They're but German, right? They're yes, German they're German. Um, but um, and I they're think very good at supply chain, I believe. They're right? they're That's awesome like their at thing. supply chain. But it was like a district manager internship, so you were, um, I was shadowing a district manager who's in charge of five different stores, and three weeks of like my twelve week internship, you had to act as a store manager at one of the stores. Oh, I love these. Were you in Pittsburgh when you did it? Yes, it okay. was in Pittsburgh, and and this was summer of. Junior year? What was this? Yes, was this summer after junior year. Summer after junior year. And these yeah. this these three weeks as a store manager of one of the stores, um, yeah, I was doing the 5 a.m. shifts, getting up at 3 a.m. And during that time, it's actually what really funneled my interest into UBI because I was just, first of all, um, Andrew talking about automation heavily and just the first five hours of our morning from like 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. were just yeah, picking up all the produce, putting it yep. down, like these very robotic movements, not stimulating on the brain yep. at all. I'm like, you know, this is the side of automation that I can, can get behind. Yeah, I can get behind. <laughs> can um, and obviously UBI is in, important in that. But I think if what really led me to UBI is how it funnels into the future of work.
Well, it's interesting. So it's it's uh, this is the the challenge is. Okay, the job can be automated. Yep. And then the next question is, should it be automated? Yep. And if you want to make more money, that answer is usually yes. Mm -hmm. But I think about, um, so my brother lives in New Jersey now, just moved to New Jersey um, from Manhattan. And in New Jersey, you're not allowed to pump your own gas. Mm -hmm. You have to let someone pump it for you. Yeah. And it's a, I mean, straight up job creation program by the state of New Jersey. And wildly popular because... Frankly, it's a mild convenience. It's actually some, but and some days is a major convenience if it's cold mm -hmm. or raining. There's someone to pump, you, you, fit, you legally cannot pump your own gas in New Jersey. Quick question: yeah. I'm always confused. Are you supposed to tip them? Oh, you're not allowed to tip them. Or you? I mean, you're allowed to, but it's very, very frowned upon okay. because they get paid decently well. Um, decent, like this. It's a good paying job. It's good wages. I think I imagine decent benefits because it's basically a government jobs program. I. Have never been a huge fan of government jobs programs. Mm -hmm. I think it's this is a good like private version of it because the the government says you have to it's, you have to have someone pump the gas and you have to pay them. I'm, I'm not sure of the actual legality of it, but they have to be paid a certain amount. Yeah. Um, but then the gas stations themselves administer that, so it's not the government creating the job itself. It's they set the policy for the private companies to create the job. Gotcha. Um, look, you can debate this back and forth, but the reality is it's employing a good number of people. And people need stuff to do. Um, so that's like the hardest part, right? Like I'm totally big believer in like, we should automate, automate, automate. But then we gotta give people other things to do. Exactly. Um, uh, anyway, so you go, you work at Aldi, you see this firsthand. Um, was the internship paid or was it like college credit type deal? It, it was paid. That's yeah. good. They, um, Aldi pays well. Another yeah. another reason. <laughs> well, it's hard because there's, it's they tell you to, you gotta get experience. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But in order to get experience, you have to, ha in order to get hired, you have to have experience. Um, oh, I'll, that's crazy. I'll never forget. All right, quick story. I am my. I went to uh, I went to Duke University in North Carolina. By the way, final four week. <laughs> there we go. Let's go, Duke. Um, I usually piss off half the room. You know, Duke, there's plenty of Duke. I, I, people hate Duke like I hate the Patriots. And I very much understand because I hate the Patriots. Uh, <laughs> but we don't cheat for the record. Um, <clears throat> okay. The... When I was um, a sophomore, I dated uh -huh. a girl who was a freshman and she, her dad worked in finance. Gotcha. And so I remember I was a sophomore looking for, the big deal was like, if you get a sophomore internship, because no one ever hired freshmen in college. Like that's where you had to work You're forever. a big shit. But if you get a sophomore internship, it's a big deal. It's like Goldman Sachs <laughs> had their sophomore program. Oh no. <laughs> and there were like a couple banks had sophomore programs. Most internships were for juniors. Um, juniors, you, you know, you would interview throughout junior in the fall and the spring, and then you get your summer internship. Um, and some of these internship paid like out the ass. Like you're getting paid a hundred grand for a summer. And I was like, and what? Yeah, like 70 to a hundred thousand, like and live in New York. I always think, and I'm like, by the way, this is life-changing money for where I was coming from. Um, well, I so, think anyone, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. pretty life-changing. So I was like trying to get one of these jobs, but if you get one as a sophomore, and then mm -hmm. if you get one as a sophomore, you're, game, you're guaranteed to get one as a junior because you have something on your resume. Most people don't have anything on their Snowball resume. Snowball effect. So I remember like getting, my, my girlfriend was helping me with my resume. <laughs> and my resume was I was a lifeguard for a summer every summer since I like was 16 like I could in high school and I worked at Chili's mm -hmm. and that was my resume and <laughs> that, I mean you know I had like I had a resume to get into college or whatever what, but where like, were you at Chili's were you like a, a I, was bus a boy? I was the host oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I was the host I love that job I mean yeah, no. I, I just can't say I loved it but I agree restaurant jobs everyone needs to have one at one point oh yeah anyway, I, I learned yeah. a lot and yes. like it was um not great because the town people I saw in town would come in and see me there and like <laughs> really doing well Zach huh like oh, no offense anyway so um <laughs> I was a host at Chili's yep um but uh, and her resume as a freshman was like 50x better than mine, because when she was a senior in high school, she interned at one of her dad's friends hedge fund. Oh, gosh. And knew yeah. all the financial terms and this sort of thing. So she got one of those sophomore internships. So she got a better internship as a sophomore than I got uh, or sorry, better internship for herself as a senior in high school than I could get as a sophomore in college. Yeah. Um, and this is like the kind of leg up stuff that I learned pretty quickly. Um, and so how I got my experience, this is like the BS where I was a lifeguard at the pool. I was a pool manager, mm -hmm. but every morning I had a, uh, I 
like a fine, like a friend of a friend's financial advisor, like let me come in and like literally stuff envelopes every day and sit in oh, like wow. the financial office of Smith Barney. Um, did I learn some stuff? Kind of, but I got to put on my resume, like Morgan Stanley, Smith Barney, whatever the heck they were then. Yeah, just um, the name. And that helped me get my foot in the door. And it's, and I had to work, I had to work for free. Um, and he was nice. He gave me some cash under the table, I was like, not say, a ton, but yeah. like he like, but like he legally couldn't pay me like oh. from there. They wouldn't do interns, so he paid me like out of the kindness of his heart. Just and it wasn't a ton, but it was enough to you know, have some spending money or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, that's the game, right? And it's awful. Um, and wait, clarify why couldn't they pay? Like they just didn't pay interns. So they, I mean, they had like a formal internship program, mm -hmm. um, but they did not have a budget for like the West Hartford Elmwood branch of. Connecticut, wherever I was, like <laughs> yeah, their, yeah, for okay. their internship. And by the way, I didn't deserve that money. I felt like I was getting a charity handout because I did nothing for him. Like I did, you, you know, gave I him did, your time. Yeah, I gave my time. Yes, but I didn't help. I literally just got paid to learn, which okay. is, that, um, okay. and I wasn't. There wasn't like a full time job opportunity there in the short run. That makes like, sense. Um, so this is what's hard. Like um, kids need to get that experience, but it's investment of the company to to do that. Um, so. Have your, this is actually where I'm going with this, peers you know, or the younger generation, let's call it Gen Z, yep. uh, as a catch all of like everybody around this, are they now focused instead of like that, like BS experience to put on a resume, are they more focused on I'd rather be a YouTube content creator, maybe get paid a little bit that way, or would I rather be a influencer or mm -hmm. get into Web3 and make an NFT art project or something like that, that's a little lower upfront cost? Like what have you seen in terms of that experience, check the box thing from young people? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's all or nothing towards either one. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're seeing with uh, high schoolers today, more extracurriculars than ever before. Like in terms of <laughs> yeah, they need to like sure. deck out, yeah, oh, deck God, out their I'll application. And so yeah, it, the, the, the burnout is crazy amongst young kids in terms of what they're kind of experiencing, the pressures in order to get into college, which is just crazy. But I mean, you're definitely seeing in the back of everyone's minds, even those pe people with full time jobs today, everyone at the end of the day, I don't think I think people um, align Gen Z with a want for entrepreneurship. But at the end of the day, I think the reality is people just want autonomy mm -hmm. and not maybe to have uh, an entity over them 24 seven. So you're seeing like in the back of people's minds, yes, when it's you have every day in your face these content creators and they have this clear autonomy within their lifestyle that's in the back of your mind and you're maybe aspiring to that a little bit in different ways but um I, I think more so you see this amongst young boys and like their role models of whether it's elon musk or whether it's the gary v's and mr beast and the logan pauls of the world um you're kind of seeing them make harsher decisions in regards to yeah dropping everything and trying to go full into something to, to a decision like content creation mm. while girls usually kind of what i've seen are more so pursuing those types of things on the side from this their is endeavors. a really good point because I'm trying to think so i was gro well, growing up you know who are your role who are my role models right mm -hmm. and i'm thinking and like or who are my friends role models right so you have like athletes you know your celebrities and athletes yeah. just everybody right but then for those in, in, in some form of like, you know, who are blessed enough to have perspective on where they want to go with their career and what yes. they want to do, then you start. But it was your Steve Jobs is your Bill Gates is your it wasn't they weren't like they weren't talking heads per se. They were just kind of figments. And frankly, what they were were like obviously brilliant and um, builders, but they were there was some form of institutionalization around these names. Yes. Um, and your Warren Buffett's your. Um, these types and there was or even like for me my this is like was a very sad day when he ended up being a pervert but uh matt lauer was a huge like oh gosh i forgot my, about that yeah. situation i like felt like i lost like a i don't know what that, that like, like a fatherly figure yes like yeah. i i really want to be matt lauer growing up now i've learned that that lifestyle is awful and like i've lost my passion for wanting to be hosting the today show the 4 a.m um, mornings every morning. yeah I, like oh man um but, um, but I mean, Matt or Katie Couric and those Al Roker, like they're creatures of an institutional establishment of a corporate America. And they had a clear journey. Right. And they clearly yeah. worked their way up. And those, that was a thing when I was growing up, that was like, you could work your way up a certain way. And now the role models for kids, to your point, is that they're, they buck the trend. 
they if Gary Vaynerchuk, it's Aaron Paul, where they're like, uh, they did something crazy and then they built a platform out of it. Mm -hmm. And the work your way up, uh, bide your time, earn, learn your skills, earn your keep, your time will come mentality is now, make it now, I'm famous instantly. Uh, you know, and then you Risk now have like all. Olivia Rodrigo is a high schooler, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, no, don't get me wrong. She's a world-class talent. So it's different, but it's famous now, right? Um, does that pressure hit your generation? Um, and mm -hmm. by the numbers, it seems to hit boys more than girls now. Yeah, well, I mean, Olivia Rodrigo, that's kind of, that, that stuff's always been prevalent because that's just like child stars. She was like, to be fair, Disney. I mean, she's well, that's yeah. a bad example. Yeah, yeah. She is exceptional talent. Yeah. yeah, but people, so for example, yeah, we were saying like Elon Musk, he more so falls into like the Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, and mm -hmm. was, yeah, within the systems and establishments and, um, obviously, obviously he had success young, but still working within this. Oh, yeah, things. he built his company yeah. from the ground up and still does. All yeah. Of it, yeah. But um, so when we're seeing these other people, Gary Vee might not fully fall into this because, you know, he does push. I worked like my ass off in my 20s and didn't yeah. really see Gary the Internet success. For those of you who yeah. are maybe unfamiliar, he's a brilliant entrepreneur and. He was one of the pioneers of vlogging, wasn't he? Like video blogging. Like he was yeah, a one big of, social media dude. Yeah. yeah. He was he's the guy who holds himself and he's like, We're gonna to the moon type uh am I doing that right? I don't know. I don't no, follow no, no. like Carly yeah. loves Gary Vee. Anyway. But okay. yeah, I mean Gary Vee definitely does push the mes messaging of you kind of risk it all. Like you don't really need to go to college exactly, right. which is of course funnels into a lot of the mindsets of boys today. But we see with the Mr. Beast and Logan Paul. Logan Paul had a situation where, yeah, he blew up quick on Vine, so went off with that. But Mr. Beast, you even see in his messaging that he's like, you know, he just, I think he just stopped going to college classes and just mm -hmm. didn't tell his parents. And mm -hmm. he was doing this entire YouTube thing. He was, every every dollar he made off of his, his YouTube videos, he was putting back into future YouTube videos. And again, this guy's, it's an out, he's an outlier, which, right. There, there needs to be those, and a lot of people maybe embody like, oh, that, that is me next, because what happens with these content creators is it feels super attainable. Like, there are these average Anybody people. Anybody can do it. Yeah, these average people, um, and this happened to them because and they risked it all. they're intentionally being relatable, right? That's yes. Their, that's how they get that's their how following. They yeah. yeah, and again, the whole risk it all thing, uh, you know, stop going to school and just put your all <laughs> into this, Did and you see, you'll uh, see success. What's her name, Rachel Hollis? Um, who's older um, than the Gen Z generation, but she, she wrote the book, Girl, Wash Your Face, has been like an influencer type, but she, seen it. she said the quiet part out loud, which is probably true as a lot of these influencers, but she said something like, uh, basically went on a tirade, like, I'm not relatable. Like, of course I'm not relatable. Like, I, and she's like, I'm rich, I work my ass off, like yeah. this sort of thing. And the reality is a lot of these like people, like, look, what she said was like, pissed a lot of people off. I'm not defending what she said, but the reality is like, to be this exceptional of a content creator and this famous, you usually have to, you're probably working your ass off behind the scenes and you doing what most people You treat it like a media not, company, right? you treat yeah. it like a business. Like, right. um, yeah, but a lot of people are like, oh, I can, you know, just pick up a camera and start recording. That's definitely happened a, a lot on the girl side who do like lifestyle content have blown up from literally just like, yeah, recording their days and such. But, um, you know, in my experience, and I, I think that people, you should always be building on the side. You should have things that keep are keeping you stable and have your foundation. And then you can risk it slowly and surely once you have, like there's proof in the pudding that, for mm -hmm. example, Mr. Beast was creating videos since he, he was like in middle school or something and there was proof that he was getting traction. And then he felt confident enough to go full into YouTube. A lot of these kids are just like, oh, I can do it. Like I mm -hmm. feel in my soul that this is what I meant for. And they just completely quit what they're doing and have no solid foundation, no proof uh, uh, of like yeah, success. One viral video today is not proof of success. Like <laughs> it was maybe five to 10 years ago right. when you can have one viral video and it really snowballs. Today, that it's it's becoming a norm for right. everyone. Has, probably has like one viral moment online at this point. Not everyone, but a lot of people do. I mean, more and more, for sure. It's more and, and more. It's tough to monetize. <laughs> yeah, and, and even I notice, like, yeah, when I meet people or something who follow me, it's like it feels more friend like. In the past, it probably feels more like, oh, like these people notice me from online. It's just like your digital presence is becoming like a portfolio, and you mm -hmm. should treat it as a resume to get you into your ideal spaces and careers, and not look at it as like a means to an end, let me put everything into it. Like do it on the side, build it up, and you will get into your ideal spaces um, 
through considering it like almost like a resume in a portfolio. Am I saying this right or understanding you correctly is content creation should be a part of who you are and what you do, but not necessarily your sole source of activity and income. Yeah, I mean, we, the average uh, lifespan or whatever of a, a content creator online, I think it's like, uh, what is it? It's like two years or something like that. I might that be checks saying, out. <laughs> yeah. So you you see these people. I I mean, and even people who were YouTubers. Um, when I was young, like I remember my first favorite YouTuber was Fred. Like he he was just like crazy online. But he he's off the map now in terms. He makes YouTube videos differently now, but mm -hmm. it's by no means what it was. The attention economy is hard to stay relevant in. You need to be setting a foundation yes. for yourself and um, things that if it all goes away tomorrow, it's fine because you used it in a way to, yeah, right. um, get you into other career paths and build something for yourself outside of it. Because also uh, people like to dumb down what it, what it takes to be like, stay relevant on the internet. It's, like you were saying, there's a ton of hard work that goes into it. The attention economy is hard and pe more and more people are getting into it. And um, people are gonna find out quick, even if they have a good year, it, c it can all go away the next year. Yes. It's hard, yeah. I was talking to a friend about this, but one of the challenges I think Facebook has dealt with mm -hmm. forever in that, I mean, they looked at it, they created this thing, everybody wanted it at mm -hmm. first, right? Um, and, and then it was, okay, well, if we want to keep this show going, yep. we have to get people to keep coming back, yes. which means eventually we have to get them kind of addicted to our shit. And it's just billions of dollars poured into contending in the attention economy. And eventually that will die out, right? Because our attention spans are only so much. They have to keep acquiring new things or building completely new products over time, right? Yep. That's a hard business. Um, uh, it probably was easy for a while, but it's just going to get harder and harder, right? Um, and that is, let me ask you, is like, I'll, I'll preface it by saying this. The best advice I ever got was take every piece of advice with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. I've had great mentors give me awful advice. Smart people I really respect give me complete dog shit advice. And I'm sure I've given horrific advice to people too. I'm sure you have, it's like, you know, advice. Of course. <laughs> is, it's almost, it's in the eye of the beholder in, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, but what advice would you have in that, with that background? What <laughs> advice would you have for, for kids that are listening to this in high school? Because we have plenty of young followers and listeners how would you approach college in a career? Because like, sadly, like these decisions when you're 16 affect you the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. um, they shouldn't, and they're less important now because there's so many more opportunities and you have your own, everyone's got their own life trajectory, but advice you have, or how would you approach that decision today? I sound so like old saying this. You're but, old like, and to, wise. So um, on for high schoolers, I honestly advise like, seriously, like get a job. Like it was like just mm -hmm. a part-time job, even if it's three hours per week, like, I, in college, I was so surprised how many people I knew who had no part-time work experience, mm -hmm. and then they get into the current the current work system, and it's just like you're taken aback by it because it really mm -hmm. does not align with the future work. And th there's kind of this weird wishy-washy situation right now, and Gen Z is having a really tough time in the workforce. But what helped me um, also just find out what I'm curious about is having a wide range of part-time jobs from high school and into college. I I worked in retail. I was a gymnastics coach. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I work. I did waitressing and hosting, and I worked at a gym. Like having, mm -hmm. and, and then all my internships in supply chain and uh, within grocery. Yeah. <laughs> like all of these things, they don't sound like yeah, sexy or ideal, but you take something, and at the end of the day, experience is what's going to teach you what you're interested in and what you're cu curious about. And I, I all, all my curiosity fed from those experiences and funneled into the type of content I wanted to create. And then on the side, I started using the internet as a portfolio, talking about my interests and everything, still having my full-time job and everything. I started using it as a portfolio. It complemented what I was doing within work. Mm -hmm. And then that grew in itself on the side. And I was able to get even more ideal experiences right. through what I grew on the side and then was able to fully go into there. But it was a strong foundation and I really just, Throwing yourself in, 
a ton of experiences. It sucks that, I mean, everyone kind of knows that high school right now feels, the education system is pretty good in terms of content up until maybe sixth, seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And then it gets to this point where they're, they're just kind of putting you in all these classes of stuff that might not even be beneficial to you in the long run. Mm -hmm. and it has not, you're, it's like, when am I ever gonna use this? If I want to be this, doesn't make sense, but I have to take this class. And what's important is the experience. Like I learned more in my internships and in my, in my jobs than honestly I did in college. I remember more from my internships and jobs than all four years of college, right. like being honest, like those experiences are honestly priceless. Yep. Um, I love that. Yeah. Um, and I must have to say advice I'd say, cause I hate when people like who are like outliers have success and then they give advice, like just do what I did. And like, um, yeah. but there is some stuff that cuts through. The first one is I'll say, I'll say three things. One, um, a lot of, it's a big problem I've seen in corporate America in particular is don't confuse effort with results. Mm -hmm. There could be plenty of things that are even profitable that aren't really actually producing results. Your result may be that profit, but it can go away pretty quickly. And, and work is the creation of value. It's supposed to be. It should be one plus one equals three. Yeah. Um, if you're a job where it's just one plus one equals two, where you're moving things around um, and adding layers to stuff. The, the way tech and things are going, it's it, it's probably gonna get automated or, or they'll cut the middlemen out soon. So understand that, really understand mm -hmm. what is the value and being able to articulate that simply. Um, two is, it sounds so lame, but fucking hustle. And mm -hmm. um, Mark Cuby's, or what's uh, is Rich Dad Poor Dad actually is, is the book, um, but it said, live like no one else so you can live like no one else. A lot of people, they mm -hmm. want the yacht, they want the this. Um, but they don't, they're not willing to work like a little bit. And when you're young, when you're, you know, 16 to 35 or so in that range, gotta that's use that energy because you be, you're going to run out of energy. I'm 34 <laughs> yeah. now. I feel I'm like, Oh, I'm like tired. <laughs> and you talk to people in their fifties and sixties, they're like, I'm just weary. Um, mm -hmm. and so when I was at UBS, I was, um, I started this nonprofit suit up that was growing and. The number one question I got from my colleagues at UBS when I would tell them about it is like, how do you find the time for that? Mm -hmm. And that's what bothered me so much because I was like, all right, we get out of here at seven o'clock if you're an all-star, like working hard. So I have a couple hours before I go to bed. So I do work then. And then I work on one one or two weekend, usually one day during a weekend. Um, it wasn't like excessive even. I was just, I didn't go to Saturday brunch. I didn't go to the Hamptons shared house as often. I couldn't afford it anyway. But to build what I... You know, it was a nonprofit too. It wasn't even like a for-profit hustle, but that opened up to a whole bunch of new doors where I got to learn yep. new skills and that sort of thing. Um, so those are my big two. Um, what was my third one before I blank on it? Mm, I don't remember. I have another thing to add. Go ahead. Too. I only had two. I lied. Mm -hmm. Just two. So also, I, I think uh, kids really undervalue Twitter. So it's interesting because when, when I was um, in middle school and high school, we were on Twitter a lot. And then it kind of was weird. There was these two to three years. In reality, Twitter is very, very big for like a yeah, journalist, people in the political space, uh, people in the tech and business space. But outside of that, hmm. kids like use it for stand culture, pop culture stuff, but they're underutilizing it when it comes to, yeah, networking experience. So mm. I think Twitter is what LinkedIn wishes it would be. <laughs> like LinkedIn is just terrible, but, um, uh, so sorry, sorry if link, anyone from LinkedIn, LinkedIn is listening. It's like a lot of folks that are uh, really, really trying to network, you know? Did you have friends in college it's, where it's like, I don't feel like y'all are friends, hard. I feel like you're a networking club. And I, I think <laughs> um, kids get the misconception that, um, yes, maybe a, a following number when people go to your page is uh, kind of like a, a sign of, oh, I should take them seriously. But in reality, the following number doesn't matter that much. Utilize Twitter and like, uh, when it comes to content creation, Let's be honest, not everyone has uh, the creative abilities that will mm -hmm. make them a good content creator. So Twitter's nice because you can cur uh, curate your curiosity. So if there's a study and you find it really interesting, like mm -hmm. retweet that and like build up this curation of like your curiosity on your mm -hmm. feed. And literally like it is, you're it, DMing someone is at your fingertips now. I right. cold DM people all the time and they often reply. And it's just like, then you have this, it, it's just a snowball effect of networking. And I used to not really understand when people were like, oh, your network and is a huge deal. It truly is. And 
we we have an opportunity unlike ever before where this is at your fingertips. Right. And it doesn't really, yeah, like I was saying, it doesn't matter your following number, just uh, build up your Twitter feed. It becomes like a portfolio for you with, and it has little effort because you can just be retweeting other people's things and um, also use it authentically. You see so many people use threads and everything and it's like so corny, like, so <laughs> like you see, you see everyone do it. It's just like, just use that platform authentically. Um, I, like I keep saying, in regards to your curiosity, cold DM people and build that network. Twitter's an amazing tool um, to get you opportunity. But don't get addicted because that shit is addicting. Well, but yeah. I but deleted the app. I just use the browser now. Your following list, it's everything on there though. Like so yeah. you, it's unlike TikTok. It's like you can just unfollow people. And then, oh yeah. I yeah. Just, um, it's just, I find myself very addicted and I, I oh, follow I am too. like Buffalo Bills Twitter, which I love. <laughs> oh, so no. many good Buffalo Bills content creators <laughs> and they, I know everything about the team. It's wonderful. Um, it really, I mean, look, it fuels a fire of fan bases. Um, it, it's crazy. The la actually, I remember my third one, third piece of advice I have, and this is, this is actually a, take all advice with a grain of salt, but mm -hmm. I think this one's very good is learn to public speak. Take the time, invest in yourself, take a course and learn how to speak in public. I, I need to do that. There is no downside to learning that skill. I've, here's here, a couple of reasons. One, you'll need it eventually. At one point or another, you'll always need it, whether you're, because even if you're like, I'm an introvert, I'm behind the scenes, I don't, you, you'll need to sell something. <laughs> you're talking straight to no, me uh, right now. Perfect. <laughs> here's the other thing. There's studies on this, but I, I, anecdotally, it's brutally true. If you can speak articulate in public and get to a point where you can captivate a room, they will think you're smarter and more experienced. It is just facts. I did a tweet rant about this, but keep going. Uh, it's uh, so I would say um, now, don't get wrong. Public speaking is hard. Mm -hmm. Most people feel pu fear public speaking than they fear death. So if you're at a funeral, this is a Jerry Seinfeld quote. If you're at a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, if you oh, will. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, but uh, seriously, um, that you can put that as number one, like learning bubble mm -hmm. speak will um, change your, the trajectory of your career. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, are, Scott Gallery's big on this, but it's it's massively true. And there's, oh, by the way, these resources are available. They're not crazy yes. expensive to learn to take public speaking course. And there's tricks you can learn. It's like, oh, I always freeze up. I always get so nervous. First of all, everyone gets nervous when they public speak. Mm -hmm. The only way to not get nervous is to practice. So you have to do it. Um, anyway, big, big believer. Yeah. So that's a hundred percent correct. And in regards to how you get nervous in public speak, it's not that not I get nervous. Camera. I'm very bad, as you guys can tell on here sometimes, vocalizing my thoughts. Mm. So, so no, that's like a hundred percent correct for sure. I have, and again, this is an outlier situation of like I've really appreciated Elon Musk in the way that he is a terrible He's awful. public speaker. But like, but also amazing because yes, of it. because uh, yeah, but and he's clearly taking courses on it and mm -hmm. trying to like learn and things like that. Yeah, yeah but I've appreciated that mm -hmm. that because I, I did a tweet thing about this the other week. I was like, um, ma mannerisms tell a story in and of themselves. Don't get me wrong, but people who are so fixated fixated on them to the point where they can't appreciate the value in someone's messaging are quite shitty. Because like, there are people who are just like, oh, they use too many likes and ums. Mm -hmm. I can't take what they say seriously. But like, also those types of people often will go and fall for something that a well-spoken con, ar con artist pushes just because they speak well. Because they, they spoke well. And that's yeah. like, well, that's the hard, so we learned this in the campaign. It was, Andrew was under the impression that his ideas would save the day. They would cut yeah. through, right? And he's like, Bernie never combed his hair and like I never worried about that. Mm -hmm. And he was wrong. Um, he was right in the beginning because, and especially because he would do podcasts mm -hmm. and some alternative media and write and like the book. But when you got to the CNN town hall, when you got to the debate stage, when yes. you got to the rallies, you needed to look apart and you needed, and it's not, um, and Bernie, by the way, he's put together, his hair is usually a mess, but like the hair is now a brand, like Andrew's hair was not his brand. Um, <laughs> but it was, um, there's a certain level of trust that comes from feeling like the messenger is uh, valid are validated or trustworthy. And confident in their yes. points, yeah. And those little things can be distracting. For sure. Um, and it's al it's always hard to sell people. So when you give them more reason to doubt you or think you're invalid or things like that, it's just, um, it adds to it. So we, you know, we gave him a fancy haircut, we put him in a better suit and- Made all the difference. Put him, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, but then, you know, and, and then by the way, it's like a look good, feel good, play good thing, which is, uh, what's your name, Hope Solo? Uh, 
goalkeeper from the uh, U.S. US soccer team, team, which maybe is got some hot water, but uh, at some point, but I guess everybody has. Uh, We move on. But my point was uh, she used to play. She was very vocal about playing in full makeup. She was like, look good, feel good, play good. Like mm-hmm. she'd go like, like essentially like to her, like, like dress to the nines. Like I'm yeah. ready to fucking rock. And I love that. Um, I would always for debates or if I had to give speech at UBS, I had like my game day suit, you know, game day yes. jacket. Um, it, I don't know whether that's helpful to you or not, but um, there's something about, there's a, there's, there's a certain value of the messenger versus the message in, in today's world too, you know? Yeah, like whatever, yeah, you, you just want to feel confident in the messaging you're pushing. Yeah. So yeah, whatever does that. Um, And Trump was very good. Trump like crushed this, by the way. Like mm-hmm. uber confident all the time, direct. Like they like Trump, like you could, you gotta, if you could take away Trump the man and what you feel about him politically and just look at him from a pure marketing lens, he was remarkably consistent yep. on that. It was always Trump all the time. You, um, you know, uh, the the online version of in terms of uh, writing content that kind of feels like uh, well spoken is kind of like the blue check mark on Twitter. Oh, yeah. It's because people sometimes when they see that, like, oh, I, I should take what this person says as, you know, fact or that it, it it's val- validated. Blue check Twitter as someone who is blue checked. <laughs> oh, yeah. Zach is blue checked. So uh, like. But it's one of those things where also, world. yeah, be careful in terms of just because someone's a good speaker. It's not me. They're always talking. Sense. We're more likely to get shit because that I get dragged to Twitter at this point daily. I think the bystanders, like kids who are seeing like blue check Twitter, you're like, oh, because you, you think of Twitter, a lot of professionals is what I don't know what kids view of Twitter is. Really? It's a lot, yeah. Oh, I'm thinking. I think it's just a, a mess. I think it's more media and a hot mess of trolls yeah like the worlds we're in we see that but yeah a lot of kids are like a a lot of you know professionals who are like uh Mm -hmm. well into their space and everything so um yeah take everything with a grain of salt online in general (laughs) oh the internet So we can't end this episode without asking you your thoughts on um, Will Smith smacking Chris Rock in the Oscars, which happened Sunday night. We're recording this on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Um, The Internet was a fire. It was, you know what, I'll say this. You have to quickly get your thoughts is uh, very rarely does something just cut through all of the noise. And I mean, all of it, right? <laughs> Ukraine was close. I mean, you know, if we're talking about like breakthrough, the biggest one I remember was Tiger Woods. Oh gosh, yeah. And that happened over Thanksgiving. So that cut through, but everybody was together, if you will. Trump did a lot of that too when he first started getting um, popularity in 2015. But Will Smith was like, I had texts from a lot of people like, did you see that, right? So what, yeah. did, you, what did you think? Um, I don't know. It's worth talking about. We no, talk it is. And I think I actually have um, a bit of a different perspective on this because I know it's an annoying topic. You, everyone has seen a million different takes on this. But I've watched um, Red Table Talk, which is Jada Pinkett Smith's show for the past, I think they've had it for like three years. Wow. Um, when it so you're like a fan here. You know no, the deal. No, I'm not a fan. No, but you know, but you're a, yeah. you, you know more than I do. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't watched it in a while, but um, I used to watch it a lot the first year it was out. Okay. And so, you know, like I, I have my thoughts about her and their more more so sway positive but um yeah i mean i have a lot of respect for their family unit and i think people can you know say what they want about the the internal workings of their relationships but also like how hard it is to stay together in hollywood how many divorces and everything you see like you know relationships are going to have their ups and downs whatever so i think when people go that route it's kind of um just weak a weak argument but um in, in regards to that too, over the past two years, you've seen that family try to be like teared apart by the internet. Yep. Trending o- often, like there was like three different instances and I, they were all kind of for similar reasons, but a little bit different and just people ripping them apart. Yeah. Like so cool. Especially got young kids too. And it, it was probably their first, ex- they were always very like positive Revered. in the limelight. Yeah. yeah. And so like that was probably their first experience of that and it was crazy how hard people went at them and so i think that over the past two years they're probably just fed up 
with the public, mm-hmm. exhausted. I think it was a lo- the situation was a ton of buildup mm-hmm. and um and yeah, she's been dealing with her health issues and that she's been very vocal about in terms yeah. of her struggles with them. So like I the Chris Rock joke to me, I I didn't think it was like that crazy. It was disrespectful for sure. Um I did think that he sh- like there's no reason to go to physical violence. Though <laughs> I will say it was People are running with the word punch and everything. It was a bitch slap. Was you a do slap. you do that with your siblings? I, I mean, at least I did with mine. Sometimes it was a he walked away right after. It was he a wasn't big slap though. It looked like his face was swelling up as he was. Trying I mean, to he took it like bit. a champ. He I, did go for good for Chris Rock. Yeah, it was. It's not uh, a like you should never boil it down to a win win or lose lose situation. There, there's none of that here. I mean, Chris Rock took it like a champ. I get Will Smith's personal buildup though. I think it was stupid. Um, but I, I don't like, I don't know. It seems like in the long run, it's just going to be whatever. Uh, so uh, actually this is a good, probably set, set way to talk about, look, the, the event happened. It is what it is. The memes are hilarious. Um, yeah. I tweeted this and I, I stand by this. Like we, it, it does show that we can all look at the exact same thing and have completely different takeaways, um, and even find ways to get in fights over them, um, which is oh, state yeah. of the country. I will say this, so this is why I'm, I'm curious. I'm fascinated by like the dialogue around it because words matter. Yes. But they don't matter as much as actions. And I think that's the nuance. I think a lot of people like words matter, words are violence. And it's like, we say that because Donald Trump would throw words around all the time. And that was like the epitome of like, mm-hmm. okay, come on, what are you saying? And things he would say or allude to and wink, wink at and things like that were, were awful. Um, but also actual violence is actual violence, yeah. right? Um, and so there's a difference between a joke and slapping someone and hitting someone, right? Yeah. Those are different. And one is worse than the other. If you physically hurt somebody, that is worse than emotionally hurting somebody. Generally speaking, there are probably fringe cases of a pinch versus mo- emotional torture, right? We can go to, but like, if we're talking general, you, actual violence is actual violence. And I don't, I think people really disagree with what I just said. I think a lot of people probably on the left more often think that words are violence. Um, and I maybe the, I don't know if you thought on the um, just where we are as a country where we believe that. And I thought the Ukraine would kind of open our we, Andrew and I had an episode on this and talking sure. about what pure evil is. Um, I don't know if we're going to get there. I think a lot of folks are very scarred by words that are said to them and it feels like actual violence. And I, I don't know how to, I don't know if that means being a toughen up. I, I like, that's probably the wrong phrase, but um, it was a stark difference to me. I don't know if you agree or had thoughts on that. Yeah, I think if it, like you're looking at it just like at face value, I completely agree with that. I think maybe people's perspective, um, th- there just seemed to be so much nuance in the situation. Like, I don't know Chris Rock and Will Smith's relationship or anything, but like, yeah, at the end of the day, it's like an open hand slap too is kind of like a a disrespect of like you're not even worth a punch type of thing. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I don't know. I, I maybe, don't know. I don't know. I don't but know. like, that, now like we're I just didn't. <laughs> no, like I I, ha- I hyperanalyze stuff too much. But I don't That's know. Amazing. Like I, but it was just like uh, open hand slap. Like, dude, what are you doing? And then walk away. I will say, that my friend went to my friend was in production when we were in um in an internship. I was living in LA for an internship uh, in, in restaurant management and he was working for the show. So you think you can dance. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was like a producer uh, <laughs> and, but he got to go, I think to the Emmys or some, one of these mm-hmm. award shows. And he was telling me like, like, cause they're like at a featured table. I was like, he's like, <laughs> I'm, I, he's like, I kid you not. Everybody's hammered. Everybody like yeah. blackout, like everybody's wasted. Mm-hmm. Now I think the Oscars are slightly different but I, I'm assuming people, I don't know if Will's drunk. It doesn't matter. It's a high emotion. But moment. I don't know. I don't know if he drinks. I don't think he does actually. Um, so the, like, I will say, um, <laughs> I would be shocked if people around them weren't hammered because that's kind of how these uh, um, award shows go. So um, I try to, that now is like maybe to hyper analyze it. Yeah, yeah. We're I'm trying to hyper analyze the reaction because that's where we are. But um, yes, yes. Uh, but yeah, bizarre, you can go down, yeah, if you probably Google like, you know, drunk Oscar moments, there's probably plenty. Um, anyway, <laughs> this conversation got a whole bunch of ways, but I hope you all enjoyed it. Any closing thoughts, Jules? Um, yeah, I, th- I think we just need to speed up the education system in regards to yeah, how we just need to do a whole reassessment um, in terms of 
experiential learning rather mm -hmm. than uh, the, you know this textbook learning. Um, how kids con are consuming learning materials are essentially content, yeah. and how uh, kids are consuming content online and what is compelling to them. It's not translating into the classroom. And there's just a whole uprising that, and I don't think it's that difficult. It's more so just uh, utilizing youth voices as a way to really align on best next steps, um, and also not putting people behind because right now college is just not aligned with uh, what work what work what work is going to be like in the next five to ten years. Right. And um, for the college system to on still thrive, it needs to catch up as well. One of the things I'd like to do in the next episode is um, dive into what how to evaluate the is college right for me? How do I mm -hmm. cost benefit this out? Um, personally, I took a ton of debt yep, and I, I thought loans. my school was worth it, but I don't know if I would say the same today. And I don't know if it was a different school um, that calculus changes, right? Um, yeah. So more to come. Jules, great to have you. Thanks. Folks, we'll see you next week. Andrew's back on Monday and then we're back Thursday. Enjoy your week, y'all.